Are you married to someone who doesn't serve Jehovah or is even opposed to the truth? You'll appreciate the experience of Alexandru and Darina Vakar. I started to study the Bible in 1993. At that time, I was 43 years old. I was married for 19 years and I had two children. At that time, I didn't know if I would become one of Jehovah's Witnesses or not, but I accepted a Bible study. At my husband's request, I started studying the Bible at the same time, but I only studied for about a year. Then I decided, I'm going to stop. I asked him to stop studying too. I told him, let's stop studying, this is not for us, we don't understand it. But in a very diplomatic and calm way, he said he would continue. When I realized he would continue studying, I said to myself, well, all right then, just you wait and see. If you really want to continue, I will somehow make you stop studying. In a subtle way, but I will do it. Just seeing him get ready to go in the field service annoyed me so much. I started burying him with household chores, asking him to help me more and more around the house. But calmly and gently, every time he would ask me if he could prepare for meetings. And one time when he asked me if he could prepare for the meeting, yet again I got irritated and said, you're not going to prepare now, we're going to clean the whole apartment thoroughly. After we were finally finished at midnight, he asked me very calmly if there was anything else he could help me with. It was not easy for him to deal with my efforts to force him to stop studying. And after he got baptized, I tried even harder. During this period, he often told me how much he loved me. Many times, yes, very often. And sometimes he would ask me if I loved him too. There were times when I would answer him, and there were times when I just smiled and said nothing. There's no other way to put it, viewers. I think what's being described here is a toxic, controlling relationship. This is not the way a spouse ought to react when their husband or wife is getting involved with a religious group just start trying to manipulate them, trying to force their behavior by unnecessarily weighing them with tasks that don't need doing. Hopefully this lady doesn't behave in this way anymore, but quite frankly, there are no guarantees. But the apparent message seems to be, this is the sort of thing you can expect from worldly people before they become Jehovah's Witnesses. If you have a spouse who is opposed to the truth, this is the sort of underhanded stuff they will get up to. They will overburden you with tasks that don't need doing, and they will emotionally manipulate you by refusing to reciprocate your expressions of love. Hearing her criticisms, those harsh replies, I thought sometimes I think I'll just give up. It makes no sense to go on like this. I said to the brother who was studying with me about this, I want to stop. And he encouraged me. He said, no, 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 don't stop. Don't quit. Continue, continue. Probably your wife will follow you. These conversations always encouraged me. And when we were finished our study, I would see things from a different perspective. I'm sure you did. So this is interesting. This guy was literally saying to the Jehovah's Witness who was studying with him, I want to stop. He wanted to stop the study. And the guy who was studying with him was essentially coercing him to continue so that by the time these studies would end, he felt reinvigorated and he felt prepared to go back into this situation where his wife was opposed to what he was doing. And it clearly didn't make enough sense to him if he was at a point where he 
was half-hearted about it to begin with. Either it's the truth or it isn't the truth. If it's the truth and you're convinced by it, you wouldn't even consider the idea of giving up on it, would you? Because it's the truth. But the very fact that he came to the point where he seriously considered stopping the study to the point where he said to his study conductor, I want to stop, tells you that he was going through this phase of indoctrination and he was at a point in that phase where he knew it wasn't for him but he was being pushed. He was being pushed by the witness who was studying with him to continue, even though it was putting a strain on the marriage. I was impressed by his kindness. I was very impressed. Many times I was musing, well, as a man, he could hit me. He could be demanding. You will sit down, you know? But no, he never did that. He never raised his voice, never spoke a mean word. Never. When she saw that I did not retaliate, as in I would not reply harshly and I would not talk badly to her, then eventually she would calm down. In his calm and mild way, he began inviting me to the meetings. He kept on inviting me and sometimes I was willing to accept. Slowly, I started to attend the meetings. I was happy. I was very happy when she said she wanted to resume her study. In August 2006, I started studying the Bible again. And in March 2007, I became an unbaptized publisher. And in July 2007, I decided to get baptized. I served in the baptism department and I had the privilege to personally baptize my dear wife. First Corinthians 13, four says that love is patient and kind. Patience means, first of all, being patient for months, years, or maybe even decades. Never give up. Never consider someone as a lost cause. Even though Alexandru and Irina's marriage was far from ideal for a long time, Alexandru didn't lose his patience. He was calm and loving. That promoted peace, and eventually it moved Arena to embrace the truth. If you have an unbelieving mate, remember Alexandru's example. And as he said, never give up. I think this is actually irresponsible advice for John Ekron to be giving Jehovah's Witnesses in this particular situation. And I think this emphasizes the whole problem with manipulating witnesses with these heart-tugging testimonials. What they're doing is they're taking a situation, they're taking a story where things worked out well, where there was a happily ever after, and they're essentially telling witnesses, do what these people did if you're in similar circumstances and it's all just going to magically work out well for you. Well, that's not quite how it works, is it? Every person is different. Every relationship is different. You can't simply take one story and argue logically, it worked out well here, it's therefore going to work out well if you follow the course of action that these people took. But unfortunately, it's precisely the heart-tugging, tear-jerking testimonials that are really going to hook Jehovah's Witnesses in. I think that when it comes to these JW Broadcasting episodes in particular, most of the material is silly or hints strongly at a man-made organisation that's being steered by opinions rather than genuinely what's in the Bible. But witnesses will be sitting through the JW Broadcasting episodes thinking, 
I'll hang on for the testimonials. Those are the bits that I can relate to. Those are the bits that I find compelling. I want to see my brothers and sisters from different parts of the world. I want to see examples of people overcoming adversity. In this case, the adversity was you had a toxic relationship where the wife was being emotionally manipulative towards her husband this was not a healthy relationship by any stretch and they replaced their toxic relationship with being together in a cult that somehow has fixed things we're being led to assume and we're also being led to assume or jehovah's witnesses are being led to assume that this is the sort of behavior they can expect from marriage mates who are opposed to the religion. This is the sort of underhanded, shady tactics that an unbelieving spouse will resort to, just inventing jobs to keep you busy so that you can't prepare for the meetings. So not only is it normalising extremely toxic behaviour, it's also sending a message that essentially demonises unbelieving partners and I hope you noticed the part where the wife just blurts out many times I was musing well as a man he could hit me he could be demanding you will sit down you know as a man he could hit me where did that come from that's like saying as an adult he could purchase a shotgun and shoot me <laughs> yes he has the ability to hit you, but why is he in any way justified doing that? Or why is this something you even need to talk about just because he's a man? It's one of those situations where the interview subject is entitled to relate their story honestly, and it could be that this lady lives in a culture or has grown up in a culture where it's normal for men to hit women, but I think that the producers of this particular segment ought to have taken some journalistic license here and edited that part out because you don't want to be sending a message that it's normal for men to hit women if things go wrong or if things get too emotional. If you are the sort of man, the sort of monster who would hit women, and let's say you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're watching this testimonial, what message will you take away from this? You're going to be thinking, oh yes, my inclination to hit my wife is normal because we've just heard this lady on a JW Broadcasting episode say that this was her expectation. Especially when you have a group with such a deplorable policy when it comes to domestic violence. We're talking about a group that says there is never a grounds to leave a marriage, to divorce your spouse other than adultery. And we're going to hear this emphasized elsewhere in this very JW Broadcasting episode. This is a religion that endangers abused spouses by telling them there's no grounds for you to get out. There's no grounds for you to escape this abusive relationship unless your spouse commits adultery you need to stay in the marriage and somehow make it work especially when you have a group with that kind of grotesque backward abusive ideology it's deplorable that they should be including testimony genuine or not that normalizes abusive behavior so that if you happen to be an abusive spouse you can be watching this nodding along thinking my behavior is perfectly normal 